This is Mises Weekends with your host, Jeff Dice. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back once again to our Mises Weekend show. We're so happy to be joined by a returning guest, Yuri Maltsev. I'm sure most of you know him. He's a senior fellow here at the Institute, uh, defected from the former Soviet Union in the late 1980s. He's a longtime professor of economics at Carthage College. He's, he's traveled all over the world and spoken on socialism and communism and written many, many articles. So, Yuri, it's been too long. Welcome back to the show. Oh, thank you. It's so nice to be with you. Well, before we get into uh, some things I want to talk about, including the death of Fidel Castro, uh, let me get your quick download on Trump's victory. What do you think uh, libertarians got right and got wrong about Trump? It's it's obviously something most of us didn't expect. Yes, um, I would. Uh, <clears throat> I I kind of think that that we made a near escape from uh, from uh, sharing a socialist future. With uh, with Cuba and and North Korea, uh, so I am kind of with some reservations, definitely, uh, because Trump is not ideal. But <clears throat> from another hand, Trump really uh, kind of uh, uh, reminds me a little bit of uh, Ayn Rand uh, characters, uh, and I think he himself he believes that he is the second coming of uh, uh, Howard Rourke. He gave this interview. I don't know if you're familiar with. Yeah, he he kind of described himself as a as a great fan of Ayn Rand, and and the Fountainhead is yeah, he's sitting on his desk all his life. Uh, so uh, hopefully, if if he will be following this model or John Galt or whatever, then then we will see an anti-communist, anti-socialist in the White House. Uh, from another hand, uh, he has some um, these tendencies of being protectionist, of being. Um, kind of having a stronger conservative state, uh, that definitely is not very attractive. But I completely agreed with Walter Block, who um, uh, who even started this uh, this website, Libertarians for Trump. Yes, uh, uh, it's on Facebook, I think. Um, so that that's much better than the alternative. It's, it's unfortunately that that fortunate that that we have a thriving a thriving consumer market, but in politics, uh, the supply of of good characters is very limited. But I do think a lot of libertarians mis- were mistaken when they thought that that Trump was worse than Hillary. Don't you agree? I think that from a cultural uh, perspective. I think in a Trump administration, there's at least a possibility that libertarians have a voice, maybe a, a one or two slightly libertarianish cabinet members. I think in a Hillary administration, libertarians absolutely would not have a voice. Exactly, exactly. And also for me, because I came from the socialist uh, state, and for me, any capitalist is better than socialist. So that was that was not a, a matter of choice for me because Trump is is uh, whatever you like him or not, but he is a capitalist. He was creating value all his life, and if you will look at uh, at Mrs. Clinton, what kind of value she was creating? She was uh, one of the one of the most corrupt figures, and uh, and uh, there's uh, all all these kind of rumors about this Russian hand in elections, and uh, that Putin was manipulating things. Uh, Putin was manipulating her as well. If I'm reading Russian press, Putin in 2012, uh, uh, Putin's stooges uh, provided $34 million to her foundation for this Uranium One deal. So that's... uh, uh, that's it. <laughs> There's a, a funny caricature in this vestia uh, where Putin is uh, addressing Mrs. Clinton saying that I want a refund <laughs> for, for his, uh, <laughs> his money. Yes, so that's, so that's definitely uh, would be a, a choice, yes. And some, some libertarians whom I know, um, uh, they, um, they voted for Mr. Johnson. Uh, and Mr. Johnson, uh, <clears throat> and I don't... Well, fortunately, all these libertarians are from California, so so they 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 vote doesn't matter whether whom they vote for. Um, uh, but I think that that was a clear cut choice, yes. And uh, and now he is appointing some. You are absolutely right. Some people with a lot of libertarian leanings. I like the CPA pick. This is this is great. Yes. Well, so. Obviously, the big news story the last week or so is the death of Fidel Castro. You wrote a great article for Mises.org entitled Fidel Castro, Hero or Cold-Blooded Murderer. I like your uh, creationist term Castrophilia to describe some of these fawning <laughs> obituaries in the Western. What, why, is, why are Western liberals still so dopey? Why do they still have this romance about socialism? 
it's just because they're socialists, because they're socialists, they're trying, and this is very bad for, for their cause, because, because to be openly associated with the people like Fidel Castro, it's, uh, it's amazing, yes, I, I, I kind of uh, I made a joke today in the class that, that uh, look, I mean, Trump was elected, and immediately, immediately Fidel Castro died, and, um, and the stock market is doing well. So the Fidel Castro is, uh, and, and again, crediting Trump with this, he was the only one who called him what Fidel Castro is, a thug, a murderous thug. Yes, uh, everybody else, I mean, look at Canadian prime minister, look at our president. Yeah. Uh, they are talking about, uh, uh, about educational system in, in Cuba, which is not educational. It's a system of propaganda, a uh, system of brainwashing, health care. What kind of health care is there? I, uh, I have a friend, Cuban friend, um, uh, in Cuba. I would invite him to speak to my classes. And, um, and one lady who watched the Seco movie by, by um, uh, Michael Moore, the, I call him the biggest propaganda person in the world. Uh, he's pretty big. And, um, and uh, she asked, she said, well, uh, I can see that this is kind of like a disaster uh, around us, but I heard you have a very good uh, medical system. And my friend, he said, um, yes, uh, we have an excellent medical system, excellent healthcare system, uh, but it can be improved, and we see the room for improvement. If we would have doctors, medicines, clinics, hospitals, then it would be excellent. And, and then when we are walking out of the, out of the room, uh, he, in Russian, he said, uh, healthcare, healthcare, swim to Miami, that's the only healthcare I know of. And that's exactly what it is. It's, uh, it's unbelievable. If you will look what people were reduced to, this is public slavery, nothing else. Well, you traveled to Cuba a few different times. Talk a little bit about your experiences there. Did, it, did anything remind you of your youth in the former Soviet Union? I would say that Cuba was way more depressing even than the Soviet Union. I mean, you see misery. You see, you see literally falling apart, apart uh, real estate. I mean, the, there's high rises, which, which, uh, which were built um, in 1950s. Uh, now they're completely decrepit states. The, the uh, indoor plumbing is gone. Elevators are gone. Can you imagine you live on the 12th floor and you need to go in the middle of the night? Then what? You run down, you go to the huge outhouses they built around, and then you climb back. Some people save on this kind of, and that's why there is a stench around the, all, this, all this real estate. Many people are dying every week. Every week the, the, the buildings are collapsing because, because they don't have any money for maintenance. Uh, even the Ocean Drive, the, 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 the nicest part of Havana, you see uh, a lot of abandoned houses, houses with no roofs, houses with no windows. It, it's kind of like a Guatemala looks like a superpower in comparison to Cuba. Yeah, it's amazing. that I noticed you, you said that in the article, and I think all of us who have kids, we could do them a big favor by traveling with them to the third world and letting them see that all the, the benefits of capitalism don't just grow on trees. Uh, you know, a great point you make in this article is about this division of people into the proletariat and then the elites in socialist societies. And you, you coined this great term, socioeconomic apartheid. And this is what Western socialists don't understand, that, it, that socialism doesn't create any form of equality. It just spreads around the misery and creates – it actually creates a super class of elites that capitalist societies don't have. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit on, on how this works? Exactly, because I really believe that socialism is nothing but but the system of 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 public slavery, state slavery. There's no such thing as public, and uh, it's a system of state slavery where and the state is also a state is a fiction, state is people who are who are kind of the great leaders, people with a, they call it with a vision, uh, Marxists, revolutionaries, and they are collective owners of this sea of slaves. And why do I call people slaves? Because, because if you remember John Locke, he was asking a question, who owns you? I mean, who, what is the self-ownership? People under socialism do not own themselves. Somebody else owns them. The people are telling, that's why, that's why even our state is, is a form of socialism because they're all the time trying to tell us what to do, what kind of toilets to have, and, and uh, what kind of shower heads and what not. I, uh, I remember it was a brilliant, um, brilliant questioning that uh, Rand Paul, um, 
uh, was questioning, uh, I think, uh, Mrs. Hogan, who was a uh, uh, representative of, of OSHA, about, uh, about what they uh, direct his toilet to be like and everything else. Uh, so they're depriving us of choices, but we still have some choices. So we, we still own ourselves in a kind of, well, in a, in, a, in a more limited way than it was 100 years ago, but still we, we, we have self-ownership. While in Cuba, the great leader, he is telling us what to do, and, and if not, if you don't do what they want, then they kill you. And Raul Castro, the, the surviving brother, he was a mass murderer himself. He liked to kill. Uh, and Che Guevara, which, uh, which kind of is still a hero on, on college campuses in the United States, uh, he personally murdered 2,700 people. He liked it. He, he was a trigger-happy person. And, and then also, the, I think the Lord Act, uh, Acton's dictum that, that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely is absolute for socialist countries. I mean, the people, the first Soviet government was the government of intellectuals. People like Trotsky, he was writing poetry in French. Uh, Lenin knew six languages, uh, could play piano very well. But then the logic of the system, the logic of enslavement of, of his fellow, uh, fellow citizens, uh, they turned them into worst mass murderers uh, ever known to human history. And, uh, and the same happened in, uh, in, in little Cuba. Uh, so today in Cuba, the population is about 11 million people, but 4 million Cubans are living all over Latin America, in the United States, in Spain, um, in, in, in Madrid, there is just Cuban, uh, Cuban quarters. Um, so this is a this is a family which which is uh, the criminal family. Criminal. It's a, it's a mafia mafia uh, which uh, uses socialism to um, to exploit uh, their own people. But this mystique endures. I mean, there's this Castro chic. There's this Che Guevara chic that that Western liberals will excuse almost any depravity uh, committed by leaders in socialist countries as long as they're socialists. Uh, I, you know, it's, it's interesting to me that this somehow manages to endure even today when, thanks to the internet, we have all this information at our fingertips about what life is actually like in these countries. Yes, exactly. And I was, uh, today I was uh, listening to Brian Williams. Uh, he, he made this, uh, this speech about um, fake news, fake news. Uh, he was uh, generating fake news all his life. And the people like him who presented socialism as a working system, as a system which, uh, which provides people with equality when the system is exactly the opposite from this. The slave master and the slave, uh, they're never equal. And, uh, uh, and this, is, this is the real fake news which are being taught about socialism, being taught in all campuses, uh, being published in all mass media. Uh, that's, that's what it is. I mean, this is, uh, this is because people were brainwashed and they're still... And also, I think Hayek, he made it, it, it obvious and, and very clear in his, in his great... Uh, in his great piece, uh, Why Intellectuals Love Socialism, uh, that because socialism gives intellectuals claim to power, claim to power. The people like, like say, Trump were building houses, building buildings, and that's why I think they hate him so much, that he lives better than them. He is much richer than, than a college professor, uh, but college professor believes that she or he knows way more than, than Donald Trump, and he does not deserve any political power. And that's why I think they, they were trashing him and still doing that in, in an unheard of manner. I just uh, every morning I'm listening to... To national public radio, which is called national propaganda radio, and just to, uh, getting <laughs> getting real angry because this is uh, this is unbelievable. Uh, lies, lies, and lies, and there was no dictator that they didn't like. I remember how they were praising Hugo Chavez, how they were praising people like Nikita Khrushchev. Uh, that's that's just uh, disgusting. Well, there's a Harvard poll. Uh, taken a Harvard University study uh, conducted earlier this year that the Washington Post reported on. And it, it claims that about a third of millennials, let's say people under 30 in this country, uh, now reject capitalism in favor of socialism. You, obviously, you teach a lot of young people at Carthage. You, you travel and, and speak to a lot of young people. Do you think that's true? Do you think millennials are, are 
Uh, you think a third of millennials are socialists? Yes, well, Rasmussen poll is even uh, putting this number at 50 percent. Uh, so that's uh, the good thing, I believe, that many people, I mean, young people who believe in socialism actually don't know what it is. They believe that it's some kind of like a touchy-feely society where, where everybody is happy and dancing around and singing uh, Kumbalai or whatever. But, uh, but it's, uh, the reality is completely different. The good thing is also that even those people who today are saying that they're for socialism, when they will graduate from the university uh, and face the real world, then all this socialism uh, would, 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 would go away uh, almost right away. I am receiving some very nice letters and emails from former students who would say that they were maybe skeptical in my classes when I was praising markets and and, and, and human freedom, uh, but now they understand that, that I was right, and, and, uh, and, and, and it's very good. I think that Winston Churchill, he made this point that if you are 20 and you are not a socialist, then you, you don't have a heart, but if you are 30 and still a socialist, you don't have a brain, and, and that's exactly what's happening, that people who just took, some, of, some people still kind of are still retarded even if they're 30, uh, but um, uh, but but I don't see I don't see that 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 this cultural war was is completely lost. I think we still have some hope because, irrespective to what all mass media was was telling us, irrespective to all this hysteria against Trump, against capitalism, against everything, uh, then still we have uh, we have the president elect who is uh, who is unapologetic capitalist. Well, it's interesting. You're of a generation, you know, teaching at Carthage where you have tenure. We have a lot of uh, young PhDs associated with the Mises Institute who are trying to develop careers out there who don't yet have tenure or necessarily an academic job. And it's, it's very, very frightening, uh, the environment in which they're entering it at these universities. They really have to keep their conservatism or their libertarianism under wraps. Have, have you ever felt pressured by the faculty at Carthage to tone it down? Um, yes, I did, but I, not not so much. For one reason is that, that I think they don't want to meddle with me, because I saw socialism, I saw the beast in the eyes, and so I would say that, that I just, that what I'm saying about socialism is way more credible than what do they say. I once discussed it with Walter Williams, and he said, yeah, you cannot tell my truth, and I cannot tell your truth. Uh, just because we're from different backgrounds and uh, different skin pigmentation. And uh, I think he was absolutely right. Yes, that uh, that's one thing. Another thing, I don't really have much to lose. I mean, I, I've been in the Soviet Union. I couldn't uh, couldn't uh, openly say what I... And so then I would defect to the United States and, and here would mimic the, 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 ruling, the ruling elite. Uh, so I, I kind of, uh, I wouldn't say wild, but I don't, I don't care what, what some people... Because I have, I, I think I, I know what, what the truth is and I'm sharing it. Um, and my colleagues, I think in the beginning, they thought that my first day in, in, in college was, was just amazing. They knock on my office, uh, knock at the door, and the gentleman is coming. He said, oh, great, you're from Moscow. I'm a communist, too. <laughs> I said, you're a communist. Huh? He said, great, and we have another communist on campus, so we can already start a cell, because you need three communists to start a party cell. And I said, well, I would disappoint you, but I'm not a communist. I'm actually anti-communist. But I'm not anti-you. I mean, that's, uh, that's whatever. And so he was very nice and even invited me for, for a dinner. Then maybe half an hour later, another knock. I'm opening the, the door, and there is another professor, professor of, of chemistry. And he said, hi, ah, amazing. I don't know how could they, how could they hire you. And I said, uh, why? Are you communist too? And he said, no, I'm not a communist. I'm a libertarian. And I am reading your articles in the, in the, uh, Freeman, in the Freeman magazine. And I am even using, use them in my classes about healthcare. And, uh, and so that was pretty bizarre. So we have some diversity. Uh, since then, both of them are retired. Uh, but, uh, but still, that's good that it is a private college. And so we have, we have a lot of uh, academic 
freedom. That means that we'll have collective adoptions. I mean, I can use any any book I like in my classes, and uh, and uh, we don't have mutual visitations and whatnot. So, so I kind of like it because I came to Carthage for uh, just one semester to find a real job, but uh, but it turned out to be my lifelong employment. I'm 25 years here. Well, Yuri, we're about out of time. Uh, tell us, what's what's next for Yuri Maltsev? What do you have going in 2017? Will you be in South Africa in January, as, as you have been in recent years? Yes, I am going to South Africa with my students because uh, there's an institution uh, uh, very similar to the Von Mises Institute called the Free Market Foundation of South Africa. In the Free Market Foundation, usually we will have a nice seminar for students with uh, people like Leon Lu and Eustace Davy. They are great South African economists, um, the libertarian economists. Herman Mashaba, who was chairman of the board of the foundation, now he was elected. He was elected as a mayor of Johannesburg, and he is also like Trump. He's one of the richest people in the South Africa, and he devoted himself to the fight for freedom. Instead, I mean, he, he could enjoy his his wealth anywhere in the world. Instead of that, he is digging into all this this corruption and all this looting, as he calls it, in the biggest in the biggest uh, South African uh, city. Uh, so I really like it. I, I think I'm more South African than Russian these days. And um, and I'm going back there in August uh, um, with friends already. Uh, so if anyone is, is willing to join me, I would be happy to see you uh, in South Africa. Well, we'll be interested in, in hearing your report and, and what's up with this uh, uh, libertarian-leaning new mayor of Johannesburg. So, Yuri, uh, first of all, very Merry Christmas to you and your family. And uh, thanks so much for your time and joining us. And Ladies and gentlemen, have a great weekend. Subscribe to Mises Weekends via iTunes U, Stitcher, and SoundCloud, or listen on Mises.org and YouTube.